I wrote this thing up last night between like midnight and 1 a.m. And the original version of it had some elaborate joke about it being a call CC continuation and whatever, because we're resuming a topic from an earlier talk. But reading through it, even I didn't understand what I just wrote, so I got rid of all that. Um, a while back, we were talking about algebraification of data types. And by that, I mean extending data types so that they have operators that you can use to compute on them that have nice algebraic properties. Um, and there was a remark somebody made about doing something with ranges. And I said, uh, yeah, that would be really sweet, but it's more complicated than it sounds. This is a little bit of a dive into that complexity. Um, I decided and we're not going all the way into the complexity. I'll point out where, we, where I'm playing a game with you. But the idea is um, that you can have ranges and you do math on them. And to motivate that, I've got an example of Ocel and the Ocelot, um, a little game where you see a little cat, like Bobcat. You guys know what Ocelot, who, who knows what an Ocelot looks like? OK, who doesn't think they're cute? Good, I don't have to throw anybody out. Okay, yeah, they're really cute little bobcatty things. Okay, and they're going around and they're looking at stuff and everything. And you're looking down, you see the little animated ocelot on your screen because you're looking bird's eye view. Ocelot, on the other hand, she only sees what she can see. She has a limited frame of view ahead of her, and if there's a saguaro or a hill or whatever, she can't see what's behind it. Implementing this game we would need to be able to compute and see what Ocelin can see. One way we could do that is we could say, OK, we're going to have a range from negative 1, negative 1.0 we're doing with floats, to 1, and 0 is straight ahead. And we've got a range, and that's what she can see. And then if there's an obstruction, we take a chunk out of the middle, and we do things. We do range math to figure out, OK, if there's a, a rabbit, how much of the rabbit can she see? Okay. Does everybody, at least in a hand wavy sense, get how that could work? The problem is that ranges, um, that's actually a computation here on this. Um, if we have our field of view and the rabbit is off to the right um, at 0 0.9 to 1.3, so it's at the far right of her field of view, she can only see the part from 0.9 to 1. She can only see a little bit of the rabbit. So we can say visible part of rabbit equals the rabbit's view range anded with ocelot's field of view, and the end of those two ranges, their intersection, is the part of the rabbit sh she can see. Likewise, um, if there's a hill, that hill would subtract out and obliterate part of the whatever's behind it. So she wouldn't be able to see the things behind. The problem is that in the general case, if we do math like that on ranges, we won't get a range. Because we could have a range here, and we take this chunk out of the middle, and now we've got do 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 do, skip a bit, do 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 do. We've got these two disjoint sets. When that problem comes up in in with numbers, okay, for instance, with integers, integers are not closed under division. If you divide two integers, you get a, a, a rational number. So we add the rationals. We say, okay, we've got an expanded vocabulary now. In addition to integers, we can also talk about rationals. So we're going to do the same thing here. And what you get when you extend it is what I'm calling an interval set. An interval set is a um, collection of disjoint ranges that have gaps between them. So like we can see this part. We can't see this part. We can see this part. We can't see that part. Blam. And we can do math on those, and we'll get interval sets. Um, a range is trivially an interval set. It's an interval set that just has that one interval in it. OK, does, um, show of hands, how many people think they understand this? I'm wanting, not expecting everybody. OK, so um, if there's clusters of people that raise their hand in a minute when we start working, if you guys, let's do that again, and then look for places where there was a paucity of hands, and go to those areas so that we've got, so, so who thinks they understand it? OK, so um, this table needs to move that way. That table looks pretty good. And you guys figured out your back. I can't see all back there. OK. So what I've got to do this, I've done almost all of the implementing for you. OK. Um, can you bring up the, oh, there we go. Yeah, and I'm going to.
pass out to, and you guys are sharing these. It's, oops. Here, there's that. There's that. <laughs> you guys go. You guys go. What? Um, oh, actually, it's on. Can you see, can you scroll? So it's on uh, Marcus Q on GitHub. Thinking outside the framework five. So the URL's up there. Yeah. If anyone wants to play with this on actual live code, um, it's on GitHub. Um, and the URL's there. OK. Hmm? Oh, yeah, there's the URL if anybody's wanting to get it. Now, in larger font. OK. So if you guys will bear with me for just a minute, I'm going to do a very quick lightning run through the code. This is like a code review, except you guys don't get to criticize it. So, uh, so if we go up to the very top, um, what we've done is extended ranges by saying, hey, a range can convert itself to an interval set. And then I've implemented some operations, or, uh, or and, uh, inverse subtraction, addition, and XOR. And all they do is they call two interval set on themselves and the other range, and they make it work. OK, so interval set, I've included a numeral. Haven't done a really good job of supporting it. And the implementation here, um, I was channeling Dijkstra. Um, it's a flag that says, is negative infinity included, yes or no? And then. It's just a list of the positions where, which are called inflections, where the sense changes. Right? So if either at the far, yeah, I'm going to be doing this, you guys have reference frame, far left of the number line, we're either in or out. And then at some finite number of places, we change, and then we run off the end in or out of the set. With that representation, if we want to convert, produce the inverse of it, we just toggle the flag. So it's really easy to invert. Um, the other thing is, it's fairly easy to probe. We just binary search through the list of indices and then do a parity check. Did we have an even number or an odd number of inflections? And did we start out in the set or out of the set? OK. So include is pretty straightforward. Um, and then, yeah, again, we just negate. Um, we just create a new one of the same class. Uh, with the same inflections, and we just invert the, the sense of the negative infinity flag. For ands and everything, it's actually I implemented intersection. And um, so I did these in terms of the intersection and union. And um, actually, if you go up a little bit more, intersection is probably the most revealing. Intersection takes a collection of these sets and produces the intersection of all of them. And it does it by calling a method called meld. And what meld does is it takes a bunch of those things and does a merge of them. And it says that um, if it, it scrolled on me, it has to be if there's n sets that we're considering here, then we have to have, um, and we're also including ourselves in it, um, if we have to have that many sets have the point. So to be in the intersection of a group of sets, it has to be in all of them. And therefore, the number of sets it has to be in has to be between n and n. For a union, to be in the union, it just has to be in at least one of them. So the valid cases are 1 through n. So both the intersection and union are implemented in terms of this primitive meld operation. 
How many people still think they're following this? Oh, I'm in trouble now. What? So um, we don't have whiteboards anymore, do we? Oh, no, I'll, I'll just do, can I, do you mind if we're right on the air? The might? <laughs> okay, the first thing I'm writing is. Not until Saturday. Not until Saturday. Saturday. Okay, can you guys all hold on for a couple of days? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I guess I could if there's markers, but I don't. Have are there markers? There are markers here. No, these. Are Bad. Those are sharpies. Those are. No sharpies, please. Is it? Okay. There's an interval set. Here is another interval set. If we want to find the union of these two interval sets, um, yeah, what we want is a set there where we include if it's in either of these. There's A, there's B, and there's the union of A and B. And the intersection of A and B is going to be cases where it's in both A and B. What? What? Oh, the other side. Oh, geez. Now, when I'm working with the kids in the school, I do things like that to test if they're paying attention. It, with you guys, I just messed up, OK? That wasn't actually a test. Um, but it, it's good, because it shows that you were paying attention. Now, what we could do here is we could actually say that, um, let's suppose we're going to do um, another one here or whatever. We could have any number of them. Um, at this point here, we are in one, one of the sets from here to here. Then from here to here, we're in two. Actually, I'm not going to do the marks. Do this in a different color down here. So here we are in one of the sets. Here we are in two of the sets. Here we're in one of the sets. Here we're in two of the sets. Here we're in one of the sets. Here we're in none of the sets. One, two, one, none. OK? So we can see that the union of them is whenever this number is non-zero. OK? And the intersection is whenever the number is 2. If we generalize this to the intersection union of multiple sets, we'll find that the union of them is when it's non-zero. It's in at least one of them, so 1 to n. And the intersection is when it's in exactly n of n sets. So my dramatic sliding that didn't go because somebody put the brakes on. Um, intersection is computed by taking the meld and accepting anything where it's, it's exactly n. It has to be between n and n, which means it has to be n. Union, anything between 1 and n, so in other words, anything but 0. Okay. So this meld primitive is essentially going through and counting how many sets it's in, right? and taking a range and saying, OK, I want to have a new interval set that includes things where the number of sets it's in is in that range. Meld is the part I didn't write for you. OK? Now, I see some really yeah, pretty
pretty experienced Ruby programmers and pretty bright people out there. You guys go ahead and try and implement meld. Feel free to ask me questions.
it's been 15 minutes. You guys have had 15 minutes. How are you doing? Everybody, anybody, anybody want to chat if they're stuck? I'm hearing a lot of productive conversations. Okay, one back there. Everyone else is ignoring me, which is great. Yeah, Wall. Where are you looking for where things are the same or unique? Right? Okay. That's what, like, I've been doing some, like, applied cryptography stuff, and it reminds me of that, where it's like, you're looking for. Aside from this starting case, uh -huh. we've established so far that you know if we don't count this for now, uh -huh. then we can count on the first two inflections between the two um, first two inflections places in the array of inflections. Okay, we have to start with one. Whether it one is being the the, non, the number. Oh, okay, so right. We have a single right. U, basically. Well, what if the two sets start at the same? Right. Well, <laughs> we're trying to yeah, just get. Oh, well, I see. That's the case you're ignoring. Right. Right. Yeah, okay. Edge case. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> unlikely. I don't feel like I totally understand many of these details, and I want to know what else we can know about the the sets. What, what are our parameters? Like what? Like what do we? What is the, going back to the initial problem? Right. So, so essentially, what you've got is you've got a set of interval sets each one of which has a flag and a bunch of intervals. Okay, So um, if imagine that what you have is something you're sweeping along that. Okay, And when you hit a start, you increment your counter. And when you hit a stop, you decrement a counter. And here, when you hit two starts at once, you just increment your counter twice. You have a two. Right? And at some place, you might hit a start and a stop. You increment and decrement, but you handle all the ones at that case first, right? All the ones at that case. All the ones at that at that inflection point. So, so a way to do this. This is not either of my solutions, but a way you could do that. You could take the inflections of all your sets, combine them, sort them, do a unique on them, and now you know all the places that it could change. Right? Then you go through that set, and at each point you say, how many new intervals have started here, and how many old ones have gone away? Adjust my counter appropriately. How do we know that? How do we know whether anyone's starting, or if we just sort it, don't we lose that data? No, well, what you do is then you go look at each of the interval sets. You go back again. Oh, you compare okay. it to the original. Or, and this is actually getting closer to giving you one of the solutions that I came up with, um, what you could do is you could take each one of them and add information about whether it's a start or a stop, then sort them, Ooh. and then you count the starts and stops at each point. That's the eight. So I got one that's about eight lines, one's about twenty lines. The eight line, the well, yeah, the yeah, um, the eight line, the eight line one um, is is trickier. Um, but it also in some ways more satisfying, and that was the one that does the you know annotate, sort, remove the annotations, and you extract the information, and you know, um, and that's much more functional. The other one is a lot of maintaining pointers and walking through the structures, um, and that was about twenty lines. So. Yes. These are M and M's. They are. Thank you. Mm. All right. Oh. They're for you. Okay. Thank you. You're, you're sad that you got, you know, yeah. the S and M's. <laughs> more, more just weirded out because you put it. Yes. yes or also, yes, I had somebody once put a Coke into a coffee cup. Right. Uh, that is completely unnerving. Whenever you're expecting a taste and you and get something, something different, different yeah. it's really crazy. Yeah. 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 I also wound up having ice cream with barbecue sauce on it once for a similar. It was like, I thought, I, I think I know what this is. No. You know when people uh, make um, like uh, pepper jam? Uh -huh. like yeah. That with ice cream is actually pretty good. It is. If you, once you get your head around what you're doing, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there's a, there's a distillery in Bend that they make this like hazelnut coffee infused vodka. Mm. And I'm not a really big drinker of vodka, uh -huh. but I, I got a small bottle of that. Uh -huh. And my first thing was like buy some really good vanilla ice cream and just pour shots oh, of it. Oh, yeah. And it was like, you know, my wife, she doesn't like sweets and I love it. Uh -huh. and, you know, 
my country only exists because the Portuguese got there. It's like, oh, there's some wood that we can use to like make sheep. And by the way, we can grow sugar cane here. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> We're everywhere. <laughs> So like I love him. I just I try to avoid it because you know lots of diabetes in the yeah. family. So she's like, I ah, don't want to have that vanilla ice cream. Whatever. Exercise. Like, no, have this. She's like, can you pour more vodka on top of the ice cream? She's like, okay. Limiting sugar, if, if especially if you're gone, you know, if you're that way. But exercise, stay active. Yeah. That'll yeah. kill it more than you know, like, oh, yeah. yeah. Because I mean, really, for most of your life, your blood sugar is going to self-regulate. If you're getting enough exercise, you're going to be, you're going to be, you know. Yeah, that's the thing, like, my grandfather, he was very active his whole life. He, uh -huh. you know, developed the type 2 diabetes in his, like, late 70s, you know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, when you get older. So try and avoid aging. Exercise and avoid yes. aging. Or don't exercise, but don't age either, <laughs> you know. True. Yeah, that actually. <laughs> that, that's actually better. You're like, yeah. You don't, don't, don't worry. Just, yeah. You know. If I can figure out how to do that. Yeah. Okay. Hibernate. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. LA is another one of the ladies. Guys, get anywhere stuck, happy, sad. Stuck. Well, yeah, you got something. Yeah, at a hand wavy level, I know. But. Okay. How how's it go? Um, you build a sorted set of your inflection points. Okay. And then proceed down the, the sorted set, um, and it, each one of those candidate inflection points, then you see whether or not. The um, whether or not we basically have the quorum that you're looking for. Yep. And then uh, similarly the actually I guess it's uh, and then the, the negative infinity or include negative infinity is is either um, the union or, or the yeah whether you if, if at yeah. least one of them is true or all, if all of them is true. Yep. So, um, so I um had originally, I thought about doing this without the negative infinity, mm -hmm. and that's a little too easy. Mm -hmm. And then there's another wrinkle, um, which is whether the sets are open or closed on the end, or whether the end point's included, and right. that makes it a little too messy. Oh, so yeah. this is my my attempt at a happy medium of just messy enough to like make people scratch their heads, mm -hmm. but not messy enough to have make them throw things at me, or, you know, so, but yeah. Is, you assigned homework. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, that's cause enough to throw things <laughs> Well, yeah. We were here for the old hangman. So. Oh, I was not. This is the oh. first one I've been to. Oh, so I used to do a hangman format where I'd write up the solution with blanks. Oh, okay. And people would have to call out ASCII characters and fill them in. <laughs> but what would happen is I had a few smart asses that were getting too good at them and calling out the stuff, and then everybody else was just waiting to, you know, right. to see. Uh -huh. This way more people get engaged. So, yeah, but no. And I kept having to make it trickier and trickier to, to start throwing them. So, yeah, no. Once when I was in grad school, the professor gave a take home midterm. This was in an a operations research class, and he, he toggled one word mm. in the problem, which changed it from something that was solvable to something that was NP complete. <laughs> and it was a take-home final. Oh man, he accidentally he typoed it or something. Oh man. And then he didn't have the balls to show up to go over the midterm. <laughs> he made the TA do it. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. So I had a professor that would always give things like that that were just ridiculous when you looked at them. And I made up, and what you do is at the back of the lecture hall when you come in, there'd be a table in there. There's something, you know, there's the the quiz, you know. So I made up my own prank one that was just like one of them was like assume this, that, and the other thing and everything like that. No question. It was just you assume all these things and further assume blah, blah, blah. And then there's other unrelated stuff. And um, then some of them were, um, uh, oh, like along the lines of, um, you know, this statement is false. They were, they were, the, the, they were paradoxical, right. right? And it was, 
Um, and then there were a couple that were clearly um, uh, um, non-solvable. You're like, hey, there's your PhD if you solve right. this one, you know. And um, I left it in the back and then left and then came in late and just picked it up like I was another, you know, another person. And um, he never did figure out, but he suspected me. Um, but yeah. Well, I think I need to wander and then in a minute call, but it seems like a lot of people are still working. How it goes? Oh, you got paper! Oh man, retro yeah, paper! <laughs> <laughs> Not very retro. What? New punch cards? Uh -huh. How does that happen? <laughs> There's a guy you've been ordering from South Dakota. He'll ask you if you're going to punch them or not. Oh, really? Yeah. Why? They're actually handcrafted. Oh, one? Artisan, yeah, no. yeah. Artisan punch cards? I've actually done that with an exacto. I've corrected <laughs> punch cards with an exacto. Um, but for the content, not the, yeah. They cost much more to ship than to buy. What it was. Wow, <laughs> that's kind of cool. I bought two boxes, you know, and I ran out of my college. And then do you just use them as scratch paper? Uh -huh. <laughs> oh man, I should get some for, of those. For moments like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've also got a bunch of punch tape. The eight bit, yeah. the eight bit the, the tape. Line of holes down the middle yeah. Much harder to, to yeah. Use get up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, even unused. That's true. Because that was like between three and five, was it? Bits. It, was all, it wasn't on. It was. It was off center. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had a whole bunch of old COBOL coding sheets, you know, the whatever that got used as graph paper um, at some point. So I needed, we needed big graph paper and didn't care if it was, the aspect ratio was consistent, so. Yeah. So. So I'm thinking at 8, I will um, call for answers, and if anybody wants to talk about it, and then I'll walk through the two. So, okay. What? I can? Yeah, I'm going to give two. And, and I'm not sure that either one of them is good. They both pass the test, but you know. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to, we'll do a roundup and um, yeah. That's, that's the problem with like computer adjusting <laughs> flights where they're trying to optimize for traffic. So it's just like, oh, you're going Forget 50 that. in a 25 zone, yeah. whatever. The lights are all green for you. No. How do you tell that there's a joint? Done. Done. Cool. Chris, Chris might be passes the, the test. Best person in this entire room <laughs> to solve this problem. <laughs> it's, it's, sort of, it's, it's math and Ruby. It's math yeah. And Ruby and that's what Chris yeah. Does. Cool. That's a fun space. I it is. It? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I sort of understood the problem. <laughs> it's, it's it's a nice spot between there are languages that are mathier but are less forgiving, and there are languages that are more forgiving but are so abysmal for math. So. Yeah. What do you get when you have sets that are touching on a point but do um, not overlap? In my solution, that counts as a whole range. Right. Then what about so, an intersection? What? Uh, the intersection, there's no inter. Oh, like it'd be yeah, isolated points. points. Um, so I think I, my solution would have that not. But you've actually caught me out. I oversimplified, oh, no. and that's that's one of the spots. I was going to I was going to confess anyway, but now I have to. We're gonna, we're gonna stretch it out. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll confess. Oh, sorry. Next time. Sorry. I was walking backwards and stepped on my shoes and started doing. <laughs> yeah. I 
Actually, when you start, are you in rush? Do you want to? Um, uh, do you have it like online someplace that we could pull up? And do you want to? Um, I don't. I have it just on here. I um, throw it into a. Uh, uh, throw it on, yeah, or something. Sure. Yeah. And then, if you want, do you want to come up and walk through it, or? Sure, I can try. Okay. Uh, what? Yeah. Or do you want to throw it up and have me walk through it? It it, it works. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll try. Okay. <coughs> Bong. Okay, it is eight o'clock. You've had half an hour. We have one solution that's passing, that's actually running the code and passing the test. Anybody else have a co solution? Did anyone else? No, I guess not. What? Did I write the specs? I, I, what? No, there's tests. There's tests at the bottom. I had some just, I had some just really, really, really inadequate tests um, because I was making this up as I went along last night. And I even thought I had a test framework, and I didn't, so I wrote my own. Um, <laughs> It's an assert procedure that raises an exception if it gets a false. Um, so, okay. Um, so, do you have that gist, or do you want to? Do you want me to go through one of mine while you're getting ready, or are you ready? Um, yeah, I've, I've got a note. Okay. Can you? Um, I'm not sure how to give us the URL, or do you want to bring your? I guess you could can actually. I, can I just email it to you? Like, um, I don't know. Or I can just plug it in. Okay. And do we need to mic him? I can talk pretty damn loud if I have to. But um, well, if you're talking loud, I'm standing over here like this. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> I don't see a problem with this situation. OK. I'll be the mic stand. Oh, cool. OK, Does it, is it showing up? Uh, let's see if I can make it a whole lot bigger. Okay, so I didn't have um, a lot of time to make the names and stuff make sense. Um, but so I started out with this idea of uh, the marker, which shouldn't be called marker. It's an array of bools, which for each of the intervals that are passed in is going to be true or false based on. Uh, okay, let me start over. <laughs> We're going to do a traversal of the number line starting from negative infinity. And. Um, for each of the of the sets that are passed in, uh, what we want to do is is keep track of are we in or out for each of those sets as we go along the number line. So we start off um, just by looking at the at the. <laughs> uh, I, I, I guess I actually have a pointer over here, don't I? All right, it's uh, I, I can I, I can work with that. So. Um, so first, I just look at them all and say, you know, are we in from negative infinity? And, and that's how I initially set up this, uh, this marker. Um, and then for the, for the uh, negative infinity value that's, that's passed in, um, I, I look and say, OK, how many of these are there? And is that number? in the OK range. Um, if it is, then, then groovy. If not, then, then not. Um, then what I want to do is I want to go through all of the inflections in all of the sets. And I, I, I want to get those in sorted order. But I need to know which inflection goes with which set. So that's what all this is with the each with index. And uh, sorry, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> no, you're great. Just, OK. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm just throwing that. So so this this infs here is is uh, 
is the array of these arrays where I have the, the inflection point, which I've called IVL for no reason, and, and, and the, the index of the set that that, that belongs to. Um, I sort them. That is actually the hard part. I spent about five minutes figuring out why sort bang didn't work. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, then I, I, I start this inflections um, is empty. Then I, I have this, this thing was and is. Like so as I traverse along the number line, going through all of these inflections, um, I, I want to see if, if the, the total, if we were in and, and now we're not, or if we're not, then we were, that's interesting. That's, a, that's an actual inflection. And so I'm going to shove it in there. Um, and that's what this line's doing. Um, no, I'm sorry. Is that what that line's doing? Yes, you're shoving it into yes, your inflections. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. It, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this line. So, so, so for each one, I, I, I look in this in, in, in the marker array, all the bools of whether we're in or out. I um, because this is an inflection on that set. So I, you know, flip that light switch, and then um, and now the new value this this is is uh, <laughs> I really need better better names for everything. Um, yeah, so that, that thing again. And then if, if was is not equal to is, that means this is, this is important, this, this inflection, um, which I have again called IVL. I don't know why I did that. Uh, so, so I pass that into inflections. Then I have to update was with the lat is, is that also, I forgot this line for a while, and that, that was another five minutes. Um, yeah, the easy parts were hard, and the hard parts were easy. As, yeah. as is That's to be expected, very common. I suppose. Yeah. And, um, and and it passed his two tests. Honestly, I, I don't huh? I don't know if it would pass all, all of the tests, but it seems right. It looks it looks reasonably it good. At least yeah. The tests that were there. Yeah. I think there's like six or so. Oh no, I guess only two of the tests touched this. Well, yeah. Path. Yeah. Only only. Good. Two yeah. Tests. You're right. Yeah. 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 Tests a and a equals a? No. Okay. No. That would that would be a good test to have if I were really doing this. I think that would yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Be, and I yeah. don't know if I would pass that. Maybe. Well, Maybe would. there's actually. No, no, I don't think I would. Um, so there's an interesting thing that. Um, remember, I said that we simplified. Um, I said that I'd simplified this some still. This still isn't the full problem. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is we're not addressing whether they're open or closed. What you do when the inflections match up actually depends on whether those are open or closed uh, intervals. Yeah, is yeah, it a yeah. hole or a thing? Yeah, We're totally yeah. ignoring whether it's open on the left, closed on the left, open on the right, and how that works, whatever. I gloss completely mm -hmm. over that. Um, this is as good as any of my solutions. Um, and as far as the variable names, just claim you wrote it like, in the middle of the night, and, um, <laughs> and, you, and people will let you get away with it. Um, so cool. Well, thank you. All right. So, um, so I've got two other ways of solving it that are very different to go through. Um, and it's interesting, I didn't even consider that approach. And that is actually a good, that's a, that's a, that's a good way to go to do it. Um, can we look at um, Dijkstra? So channeling Dijkstra. Um, I did something that is similar to what he did, but turned on its side. I counted the sets that have negative infinity to start. And I say my initial state and my initial negative infinity is, does OK include that depth? Um, I start with my empty set of inflections. Now, he pre-built some data. I'm just walking it raw. Um, well, actually, no, I guess I am building a hash of interesting ones, rejecting the ones that are trivial, that don't have anything, and um, mapping them to um, the set and a, and a zero index. Putting that into a hash. And then while that index is not empty, while I've actually got interesting things I haven't traversed, I get the keys of the active sets that are still contributing to my solution. Then I do something probably lame and inefficient. I go through and find out what inflection is next in each of them and do a min to find the first one. Um, the whole sorting thing would probably be more efficient there. But I've got my v. Then I go through each of them again 
and I find out which ones are actually have an inflection point there. The change in depth, I take those hits and I map them based on whether the index is odd having the same parity as the negative at infinity. I either add one or subtract one to my depth. And then I inject plus. So I sum all those pluses and minuses up. I now have a change in depth. The new state I'm going to be in, this is equivalent to his is, um, is does the OK include the depth plus the delta depth? The inflections, I add the V into it unless the state is equal to the new state. If there's no change, I don't add it. Then I state equals no state, update this. And then I remove any ones that I've exhausted. I update the index pointers, and then I do the thing. And the, I will argue that this is more Dijkstra-ish. Um, yours was doing things like sorting and calling out to external procedures. Well, except for the hash, I guess, is kind of cheating. But most of this is things that you're doing walking through with integer pointers and arrays. And this could be cleaned up, I believe, into something that was entirely integers and arrays and just stepping through things. Um, can we go to the functional one? The other thing I thought is, how would a Haskell programmer solve this? Um, this isn't it. Um, I couldn't get myself. It, it's hard when you've been doing this stuff at 1 AM to go, OK, I'm going to be rigorously functional with no side effects. And no, no, I'm not. But I came close. Um, I started out again with the depth starting the negative infinity. And um, the negative infinity for my result is going to depend on whether the initial depth is OK. For my inflections, I take all of my sets and I map them to a set, uh, uh, to a, um, a list of, um, I think what this is now. OK, um, the inflection point and then negative 1 raised to the power of i where i is my rolling counter of how far am in, a, in I am. So negative 1 to an even power is going to be 1. Negative 1 to an odd power is going to be negative 1. So this thing here is going to go 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1. And it starts off based on the negative infinity. So it starts off at the right even oddness so that I've now got that. Then I just group them by the first and sort them. And I map um, the pairs. For each, for each um, inflection, there's the pairs. And I say, OK, what's the depth? And what would be the depth if we made all those changes to it? And I select the ones where d1 and d2 have changed their state, where d1, the, d1 being included, xor with d2 being included is true. So these are the ones I care about. And for each of those, I then just map the first and take the value of it. And that gives me my inflections, which I pipe into there. Um, a lot more clever and in some ways more opaque. Um, that's a, a bit denser. Um, actually, the treehouse group um, we were talking about, and we started on, there, there's another way you could do this that was less daisy chaining fluent you know, calling the results that might be a little bit more readable um, that would, I think, heading more in the direction of, uh, Chris, is it? No, what? what? Yeah. Chris. Yeah, heading in the direction of Chris's solution. Did somebody have a question or I saw a hand? In, uh, you know, like in a known language, like Ruby, what's, uh, what's the of that? Oh, man. Um, well, most of these are linear passes on the sets. And generally, the number of sets is going to be small. I guess if the sets are large. Um, so it's, it's, it's something. Yeah, I, I think the worst is probably the sort is going to be n log n in the n total number of inflections. Um, but that's still better than the end of the squared or end of the third of my going through and finding the min you know, and doing that nested each time. So this is still progress. Um, and um, yeah, for some sorts of data cases, like the case for the graphics, this is a pretty good structure. If you're going to have a lot of discrete points, 
Um, if instead of rabbits in a desert, you're looking at stars in the sky and you're trying to do transiting of planets, bad data structure, bad, bad data structure. Um, because you're mostly not going to have interleaving and there's a lot of stuff. So, um, so anyway, any other questions? No? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why not just have, um, you know, why is that basically a range and not? Oh, not like a lower limit. Yeah. It must be at least this. It must be at least this tall to right. ride this ride. You're, you're allowing perverse conditions, but you, can, you have to have at least two, but not more than five. Um, I think actually for the XOR case, um, in one of the, if I can do this here, um, so XOR which I skipped over, calls meld with one to one. Um, in class interval set the up arrow. So it has to be in exactly one of them for the XOR case. Um, and also because I was hoping to tangle people's minds by having ranges in separate contexts. <laughs> so you got to think about ranges this way and think about ranges that way. Um, but yeah, if it was just for using this, just having a, it has to be at least this much. Um, would and actually that could optimize things. Yeah, that could actually be uh, less general, but a lot easier to implement efficiently. And it might make sense to just not have X or B use of this code. So, any other questions? Cool. Okay. Thank you all very much for your patience, and um, thank you all for. I saw some really hard work out there. People really getting their brains engaged on this. That's great. So, thank you all very much. So.